Well, it is a bit of a global meltdown. We are seeing Asian markets uh, still at the lowest or heading to the uh, uh, lowest point of the day yet again after some recovery. Nikkei down 1.3. Kospi down almost 1% after showing some recovery intraday. And there you have the Hang Seng Taiwan Index also uh, uh, down 1% and 1.5%. And Actually, it's a global fear of inflation. You saw the US numbers coming in, in for April at 8.3%, higher than the expected 81 And the Indian inflation number due today is also expected to be higher than street estimates. Street estimates are at 7.5%, but uh, the big uh, mid-term uh, increase in rates by the RBI is giving a sense that the RBI is expecting a number probably closer to 8%. So, inflation uh, shocks and central bank tightening across the globe. Where do we go? Do we go to EMs, DMs, which countries in EMs? To answer all that, we have with us Jitanya Kandhari. She wears many hats for Morgan Stanley, Deputy CIO Portfolio Solutions uh, and Multi-Asset Group uh, as well, the head macro research for emerging markets at uh, for the equ emerging market equity team at Morgan Stanley. Thank you very much, Jitanya, for joining us and staying up for us. Uh, uh, Jitanya works out of the United States. Well, first up, I wanted to understand, uh, you know, uh, are you looking at a recession in the United States? Or do you think that uh, the central bank will be able to manage some kind of a soft landing? Hi, Lata, and thanks for having me on the show. Uh, yes, it's been one of the key questions here. Are we going to uh, achieve a soft landing, which is what the Fed has been talking about more recently, or are we heading into a recession? Uh, my view uh, so far is I don't think we're getting into a recession this year because I think that you know, we are in a in a state where the consumer is pretty strong, sitting on uh, $2.3 trillion dollars, uh, of uh, savings uh, and also the fact that you know the producer side of the economy with the U.S. shale and some come back in that activity actually offsetting some of the consumer slowdown. Uh, so at this point, I don't think we're heading into a recession this year. There could be a possibility towards the second half of next year if the tightening continues at an accelerated pace. Uh, and that's, again, something uh, to watch based on what really happens uh, with the inflation numbers. And there again, the key thing for me is wage inflation. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, transitory factors, as we know, the used cars and gasoline, et cetera, where we are seeing uh, some tempering of the inflation. But I think the big problem is the wage inflation. We are sitting with very, very tight labor markets here, and that will determine the path of the hawkishness uh, in the Fed policy and will determine where we are from a recession perspective. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I was reading your report and you say that uh, U.S. inflation is going to settle at a higher level. So this is kind of a secular, I mean, the decade of 2020s is going to see higher inflation according to you? Yes. So we peaked average decadal inflation in the 19. 80s at uh, seven percent plus, and ever since every decade we've been downshifting. The last decade, average CPI in the U.S. was 1.8 percent. Mm. Uh, I don't think we're getting even close to what the Fed expects as its target for core PCE at two percent. I think we settle at three four percent inflation levels uh, in the next four five years. So yes, we will uh, hopefully. Uh, come off from the 8.1 levels, but at not at an accelerated place. It'll be, it'll be a very slow moving inflation number. Uh, but throughout this, the rest of the next three, four years, I don't see us going below three, four uh, percent CPI in the US. OK, not below three, four. Uh, so how would you read the Indian inflation number in that case? Uh, if you're looking at a decadal level, then from near double digit in the earlier part of the 2010s, uh, we have with inflation targeting come to, uh, you know, managed between 4 and 7%. Uh, do you see us also, you know, getting back to higher inflation numbers, stabilizing at 7? Or do you think this time around the differential between Indian inflation and US inflation in a secular basis is going to reduce? Yeah, so great question, because if you look at 
EM inflation, and you look at that just, you know, zooming out EM and then coming back to India, mm-hmm. EM inflation currently on a market weighted basis uh, is at 4.3%. Uh, the first time since the mid 1990s, where we have aggregated numbers, uh, EM inflation is much lower than US inflation. So that's like a first time yes. uh, story in the last many years. Uh, what is interesting in just overall emerging markets is that central banks have been preemptive in the tightening cycle. For example, last year, Brazil was like first in and probably will be first out uh, on, on the monetary side. So they, there has been a lot of preemptive tightening in emerging markets compared to the US, where Fed is seriously behind the curve. Uh, even uh, in India, of course, I do expect inflation to move up slightly, but uh, zoomed out uh, relative to many other markets. I don't see Indian inflation as a big issue. Uh, and again, it's the target uh, of central banks. Uh, Fed, where Fed is versus where the actual number is in the US, there's a big differential versus the target. In the Indian case of uh, four plus and minus 2%, I don't think we go significantly above the target. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think that that number is definitely looking better on aggregate uh, for the emerging markets. And what's really what really interesting, as I said, in the US, we have 11.5 million job openings mm. and, and we have only 6 million unemployed people. So it's a very tight market, mm. which is typically the problem for uh, stickiness and in inflation. In India and other emerging markets, I don't see a wage-driven inflation issue. It's uh, more supply-driven, rather than a demand pull driven inflation which is the problem for for us so it's different in in the emerging markets and in the case of india and i i see some of the supply issues uh, solving uh, the emerging market inflation problem because us we are growing above trend in emerging markets we still have capacity mm. uh, and we are not hitting the demand uh, side of the story, wherein demand pull inflation is going to be uh, sticky. Uh, that's more of a developed market problem. Fair point. In that case, how should we approach the currency? Because today, the rupee is at its lowest level, you know, 77, 57 to the dollar. Uh, but it's been remarkably stable. We have thrown everything at it. We've thrown crude prices uh, at over $100. We've thrown uh, FII's legging out. Uh, and we have thrown a tightening Fed at it. But the rupee is remarkably stable. Is it because of this fact that uh, our inflation is not as bad as uh, developed market inflation or US inflation? And therefore, how do you see the rupee going forward? Do you think it will be spared the blushes that it saw in the taper tantrum? Uh, So clearly, the the rupee uh, is, there are two, three things working for, again, emerging markets and even the rupee. One, of course, the inflation. So the relative inflation differentials determine the competitiveness of the currency, and we I don't see a big problem. Even on the external side, the current account side, uh, the current account, again, aggregated EM is in surplus. I know India has a, um, a marginal deficit, but a lot of that deficit is plugged by FDI uh, in terms of as FDI numbers as a share of GDP. So it's not driven by portfolio flows, which are the more volatile kind of flows on the external accounts. So I don't think that this is the taper tantrum scenario. I I also don't feel like that uh, you know, the, the real interest rates, uh, which were much more negative uh, during the past, that's not the story again. So Overall, I, I feel that emerging market currencies should see the light of the day once the de- dust settles. We are clearly seeing uh, a flight to safety, uh, you know, a typical dollar move that happens uh, during risk aversion, uh, you know, with all the conflicts with China zero COVID policy, with also Fed policy tightening. Uh, but I think once the dust settles, emerging market currencies as an aggregate on many metrics uh, like the real effective exchange rate metrics or even the purchasing power parity metrics are looking very cheap. And India looks somewhere in the middle on a relative mapping because some of the commodity currencies uh, have been hit much, much harder in the last decade. Uh, so I don't feel very worried about uh, about the currency mm. uh, on a 6 to 12 month view uh, out. Okay. 
Well, I hope what you say is right because uh, I remember in 2008, I was still in the seat and we used to rejoice that we didn't manage our banks as badly as the US has done, which were all undercapitalized. And we thought, uh, uh, you know, we had, uh, uh, you know, decoupled, that was the big word. Now we think we have managed our economy better. Uh, let's hope this time we are right. Uh, but uh, Jitanya, you know, uh, uh, people want to know, since you advise your emerging markets team, uh, how will smart money move? Will they prefer EMs over DMs? Within EM, where is India in the pecking order? Uh, so I think, you know, India specifically is highly correlated to the U.S. markets. I mean, and that correlation has, you know, irrespective of what the fundamentals say, India is highly correlated. So it will move with the gyrations and the volatility uh, of the U.S. stock, stock market. Uh, from a relative mapping of India, uh, again, relative to most of the emerging markets, especially China. I think from a fundamental standpoint, India looks very attractive uh, because of uh, many economic reasons. And I'll come to that. Uh, the issue with India is more from a valuation standpoint. And what has been the eye of the storm in this recent sell-off has been a uh, uh, growth year uh, stocks and growthier parts of the market. Uh, and that's obviously impacting India as well, uh, of course, along with the oil price increase and fears there. Uh, so the valuation side of India is, is the question uh, in the mind of investors always. From a fundamental side, you know, I do like the commodity countries uh, at one level because uh, they are seeing a positive terms of trade shock, uh, external liquidity, which will get transferred to domestic liquidity, domestic banking systems and a credit cycle, etc. So I do like a group of commodity countries. But in this deglobalizing world, I, I do like domestic markets that have uh, domestic uh, uh, growing capacity, dem demographics, and you know all the structural issues, domestic liquidity, uh, especially with respect to China, where you know the credit cycle is so stretched. Uh, it's a highly indebted economy. Uh, uh, the investment cycle is uh, very stretched at forty-two percent of GDP uh, investments to GDP. Uh, real estate there, twenty-five percent of GDP, with all the value-added industries linked to real estate. India's only beginning uh you know an investment cycle real estate is not uh not at those levels as a share of the economy uh, the credit cycle looks uh, even better uh so also from a you know index constitution if you look at china which is 30 percent of the index versus uh, india being 12 percent of the msci index and in china also there is uh, so much of uh, the market cap in in stocks and in the internet, e-commerce, gaming, education space, where shareholder maximization is not the mandate of the government. Yes. They're following an ideological agenda. Uh, and I don't see that in India. It's a more diversified uh, market where, you know, the shareholder value uh, uh, is held. Uh, and, and along with some of the other commodity markets uh, within the emerging uh, market, universe, uh, I think India looks relatively attractive. Uh, it may feel the pain when growthier parts of the market and then the US is correcting because of the high correlation with those elements. Okay, it's a great uh, point on which to end this conversation. Thank you very much, Shipra uh, uh, Jitanya, for uh, staying on with us, for staying up for us and for that uh, extremely enlightening conversation. Uh, well, key takeaways, uh, uh, Jitania, uh, and she's a very important person advising the Emerging Markets Group, doesn't expect recession in the US, though she expects inflation to be uh, much higher in the US than what it was in the previous decades. 1.8% in the previous decade should be, you know, about 4% in the current decade. Uh, the emerging markets, including India, will do better on the inflation front, will not uh, follow uh, the developed markets. Uh, and within emerging markets, she's quite bullish on India not really worried too much about currency pressure. The worry about India is only valuations as well as the high valuation areas, the growth stocks, which are trading at a premium. So we will move down with the markets when the macros are strong or look like one of the best set that we can have in the decade that's coming.